Okay, I'm going to talk today about abandonment depression, and I'm going to show you where this comes from so that you can go and access a copy for yourself so that you can sit with yourself and figure out depression and how this occurs in us um, and, you know, what to what level and degree it's, you know, a normal feeling that human beings have. Through childhood trauma, we can get very stuck in looping our emotions and thinking there's something wrong with us. So the information I'm going to read is called Managing Abandonment Depression and in Complex PTSD, and it's by Pete Walker. And I'm going to now show you the book that that's from. So you see this slide here. It's from this book, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. He is a therapist in California, in Berkeley, and he basically, this book is groundbreaking and it's life changing. And from picking this up, it did take me a couple of years to begin to really integrate all of the information. But when we're healing deep childhood stuff, this is information that we really need to know. So for me, I had two years of trauma psychoanalysis that finished in July 2020. But we're in a constant, we're a constant work in progress. And information takes time to filter through. And the reason is to integrate something, we have to experience it. It's not just reading something. We can read something and then, well, it's only when we experience what is going on in the psyche that we are able to put two and two together. And that is a process. So Pete Walker absolutely says, and this is really important, that healing is not all or nothing. It's not black and white. It's um, an ongoing process of feeling feelings and emotions that we explore. And as we develop and grow and the more conscious we become, then we get to a place of stabilizing and also being able to, to pull us out ourselves out of the fight, fight, freeze, fawn, which only we can only really do that when we understand what it is and why we're having those responses to our past. So I'm going to read now, and it's um, quite a couple of pages here. So if you just want to sit back and or get a cup of tea or whatever you do, and just have a listen to what this says. So this is Pete Walker from his website. Here is a map of the layering of defensive reactions to underlying feelings of abandonment that are typically found in complex PTSD. The territory is best viewed through the unwinding the dynamics of emotional flashbacks. Flashbacks are, at the deepest level, painful layers of reactions, psych physiological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral, to the re-emerging despair of the childhood abandonment depression. One very common flashback scenario occurs as follows, internal or external perceptions of possible abandonment trigger fear and shame, which then activates panicky inner critic cognitions, which in turn launches an adrenalized fight, flight, freeze or fawn trauma response. So, you know, adrenalized means you basically, the adrenaline really gets going, okay? So subsequently referred to as the four Fs. The four Fs, which is the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn trauma response, correlate respectively with narcissistic, obsessive compulsive, disassociative, or codependent defense reactions. Now, what I've just read here, none of this makes us wrong. It's just that we're human beings and we all contain these four Fs, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response in us as normal responses to life you know if you were going to be chased by a bear for example you might go into you know flight and run but if you you know somebody was trying to grab your bag for instance you might go into a fight and if somebody was going to attack you you might go into a freeze or you might go into a fawn and try and appease the person so you know these responses are within us and they basically protect us you know because we want to live and they're normal responses that's a good thing to understand. So here is an example of the layered processes of an emotional flashback. A complex PTSD sufferer wakes up feeling depressed because childhood experiences has conditioned him or her to believe that he or she is unworthy and unacceptable in this state. He or she quickly becomes anxious and ashamed. This in turn activates the inner critic to goad her or him with perfectionist and endangering messages. The critic clamors, no wonder no one likes you. Get your lazy worthless ass going or you'll end up like a wretched bag lady on the street. I, 
sorry, re-traumatized by her or his own inner voice. We then launch into the most habitual four Fs behavior. He or she lashes out at the nearest person as he or she becomes irritable, controlling, pushy, which is fight, and that's a narcissistic. Or he or she launches into busy productivity driven by negative perfectionistic and catastrophic thinking, and that's the flight obsessive compulsive. Or he or she flips on the TV and becomes disassociated, spaced out, and sleepy. And then we have, that's the freeze and disassociative. Or he or she focuses immediately on solving someone else's problems and becomes servile, self-abnegating and ingratitating, I think it says, fawn, forward slash codependent. Unfortunately, this dynamic also commonly operates in reverse, creating perpetual motion cycles of internal trauma as the four Fs acting out also gives the critic endless material for self-hating criticism, which in turn amps up the fear and shame. And finally, it compounds the abandonment depression with a non-stop experience of self-abandonment. So this is where we start to abandon self. You know, we think there's something wrong with us. We're not perfect. Um, we feel ashamed. We feel, you know, afraid to deal, you know, deal with life and so forth. So then he says, here is a diagram of these dynamics. So triggered abandonment depression, fear and shame, the inner critic activation, perfectionism and endangerment, and that's the four Fs, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn response. Especially noteworthy here is how the inner critic can interact with fear and shame in a particular vicious and escalating cycle. So you might have noticed that like some, something freaks you out and somebody triggers you, um, they might say something or use a word like one of the words, you know, that triggers me um, was, you know, it does not so much now, but people when people said forgiveness, that I had to forgive. It's like I used to get in a, into a right state because nobody knows what I experienced as a child. So people just telling me that and giving me um, unadulterated advice, you know, without knowing my real true story was very painful for me because it was like I wasn't being heard and I wasn't heard as a child so you know that just is a repetitive thing and then I think there's something wrong with me because I can't forgive and then I you know went off go you and then we go off into a vicious cycle that escalates and then we might go and disassociate by having some alcohol or you know codependency and it's just so all of our childhood stuff, like how it plays out in our adult life can be so difficult for us. And we have to self-educate in order to understand it. So going on, also I do sessions with people. So if you want to do work on this with me, be, feel free to contact me. I'm not a psychotherapist, but I'm a mentor and I coach. And I also am an, ev in part, an evolutionary astrologer and look at astrology as well through that, just so you know what I'm doing here in case you haven't watched any of my videos before. So then I'm going on reading. This article describes a treatment approach that decreases re-traumatizing reactivity to the internal effects of the abandonment depression. It guides the client to meet abandonment feelings in an equinomious way by staying somatically present to the physical sensations of depression and fear. This in turn promotes the ability to fill through abandonment experiences without launching into the inner critic and the four Fs acting out, which the acting out would be the, um, you go, it would then turn into the outer critic as well. I'll do another video on that another time, but you know, it's going to keep reading here. So R.D. Lang, he says, once stated, I don't know who that is, it's, it must be an author, the only pain that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid unavoidable pain. In my experiences, in my experience, resisting unavoidable encounters um, with depression and fear accounts for, for, for more than the lion's share of the PTSD client's pain. So when we try to avoid it, and we don't really feel what we're feeling and we try and stuff it down with something, you know, whatever it's going to be, food, you know, gambling, sex, relationships, um, shopping, um, you know, overuse of the internet or whatever, whatever, we can go on a, a huge list of what it could be. Then basically it's just adding to the pain because we're not really dealing with anything. Reading on. 
the etiology of self-abandoning responses to depression. Chronic emotional abandonment is one of the worst things that can happen to a child. And I'm going to repeat that. Chronic emotional abandonment is one of the worst things that can happen to a child. It naturally makes him or her feel and appear deadened and depressed. Functional parents respond to a child's depression with concern and comfort. Abandoning parents respond to it, the child, with anger, disgust, and further abandonment, which in turn creates the fear, shame, and despair that becomes characteristic of the abandonment depression. So we can see how that then can play out in childhood. You know, we really have to think about what we're saying and reading here. A child who is never comforted when she or he is depressed has no model for developing a self-comforting response to her or his own depression. Without a nurturing connection with a caretaker, he or she may flounder for long periods of time in depression that can devolve into the failure to thrive syndrome. So this might mean, you know, failure to thrive would be that you just can't take care of your daily needs. You know, you, you just can't get your act together. Like you might see yourself, you, you can't get in the shower, you can't, you know, get your food together, you just want to sleep, you know, your fight, flight, freeze form, you're just playing out. In my experience, he says, failure to thrive is not an all or none phenomenon, but rather a continuum that begins with excessive depression and can end in the most severe cases with death. So don't be scared when I've just said that. So, you know, we've got, we basically we're educating ourselves so that we evolve this stuff. So that he's just, this is just his example from his website. Many PTSD survivors thrived very poorly and perhaps at times lingered near the end of the continuum where they were clo close to death. So that can be emotionally where we feel so deadened that a parent isn't, taking care of our needs. And when we're children, we don't know that that's what's happening. We, we're not aware that, you know, we just don't get, we don't, we can't comprehend what's going on. We just have feelings and emotions. So he says where they were close to death, if not physically, then psychologically. When a child is consistently abandoned, his or her developing super ego eventually assumes totalitarian control of his or her psyche and carcinogenically morphs into an inner toxic inner into a toxic inner critic he or she is then driven to desperately seek connection and acceptance through the numerous processes of perfectionism and endangerment described in my article shrinking the inner critic in complex ptsd so again you just go to his website and you can clock that one and then shrinking the outer critic the in, shrinking the inner critic so he's got 14 steps for shrinking the inner critic there if you want a copy of that, you can email me as well. Um, just look below this video for my email address. Her inner critic, his or her inner critic, also typically becomes emotion, an emotional perfectionist as it Im imitates her parents' contempt of her or his emotional pain that about abandonment. The child learns to judge her or his dysoric, dysoric feelings as the cause of his or her abandonment. Over time, his or her effects are repressed, but not without contaminating the thinking process. Unfelt fear, shame and depression are tra transmuted into thoughts and images so frightening, humiliating and despairing that they instantly trigger the escapist 4F acting out. Eventually, even the mildest hint of fear of depression, no matter how functional or appropriate, is automatically deemed as danger-ridden and overwhelming as the original abandonment. The capacity to self nurturingly weather any experience of depression, no matter how mild, remains unrealized. The original experience of the parental abandonment devolves into self-abandonment. It's a double-edged sword, hey, when you, when you look at this stuff. So you get abandoned and then you abandon yourself because you've been you know, you've been imprinted with stuff that you're, you, you know, there's something wrong with you, that you're not good enough, that you're never going to be good, that people are scary and no one cares about you. So then we abandon that ourselves. This is what happens. The ability to stay supportively present to all of one's own inner experience gradually disappears. And that's why people disassociate because they can't stay with those feelings because they're too uncomfortable. So if you have addictions of any kind or you see where you need to sort of like pick up the pieces of your life, you know, whether it's your finances, it's food, it's, you know, looking after yourself, 
do know that this is a journey and you will get you will heal those things and it's a day by day thing and then getting to the point where we can sit with ourselves like today I felt sad today and I know I'm not alone you know so many people over the world with what's going on are feeling that at this time with COVID I've spent so much time on my own um, since you know I had COVID for 37 days March and April and I've not been around people all year I've literally been getting on you know at home doing my creative things but it works for me you know it's not going to work for everybody but I do have the odd day where I feel lonely and this is you know it's okay to be lonely it's okay to feel these things and then we need to voice them we do need people that we can talk to you know that do get us as well and don't disassociate and get us to disassociate from what we're feeling we don't want that we don't want people telling us not to be negative and be positive and you know if you've broken up from a relationship saying oh there's plenty of fish in the sea and stuff like that we don't we need people who actually hear us and, and hold our hand and we do that for others too okay so going on we can gradually deconstruct the self-abandoning the self-abandoning habit of reacting to depression with fear and shame in a critic freak out and for f acting out the processes described in this article and my paper managing emotional flash flashbacks in complex ptsd so also go to his website he's also got 13 steps for managing flashbacks which i've got a pdf copy as well if you want that just tell me and i'll you email it to me email me a request and i'll send it to you and then he says, awaken from, so with the 13 steps for managing flashbacks, awaken the psyche's innate developmentally arrested capacity to respond, you know, in a, in a kind way to depression and the, you know, a balm and the fear and the shame that attaches to it. It's a long, difficult journey, however. So do you understand this? You know, this is, there are no quick fixes out there for this sort of type of stuff. And um, when we know that, we can start being kind to ourselves because when we're not fixed, we go and do a modality that says we can heal you from, you know, all of these issues. I mean, I did everything. I did, you know, fast EFT. I did neuro-linguistic programming. I spent thousands on those things. And I'm, just, you know, and then I moved on to Carl Gustav Jung, um, astrology. You know, I was in spirituality. I did a whole course in miracles. You know, I tr kept trying to fix myself because I was so imperfect and I couldn't forgive. I was such a bad person. So now I'm in a much better place. And this has been through knowledge, okay, and sharing with people. So continue reading. So it's a long, difficult journey, however, for even without attachment trauma, feelings of fear and depression are difficult to accept and weather. So get that. Even without attachment trauma from childhood, fear and depression are still difficult to accept and weather for you know, somebody who's had a pretty decent, okay parenting. So do know that, you know, this is, there's nothing wrong with you and there's nothing wrong with me, okay? Um, so the normalcy of depression. We live in a culture that judges fear as despicable and depression as unpatriotic violation of the pursuit of happiness. Taboos about depression even emanate from the psychological establishment where some school strip schools strip it out of its status as a legitimate emotion dismissing it simplistically as mere negative thinking or as a dysfunctional state that results from the repression of the less taboo emotions like sadness and anger i believe we must learn to distinguish depressed thinking which can be eliminated from depressed feelings which can sometimes be felt occasional feelings of innovation and anhedonia are normal and existential part of the admission price to life moreover depression is sometimes an invaluable harbinger of the need to slow down so you know sometimes we might get depressed with our job and think god you know this job is really depressing or this relationship is really depressing or my family are really depressing so what you know this is telling us something um, to slow down, to drop um, into, into a place that at least allows us to restore and recharge and at best unfolds into our deepest intuitiveness. We want to access our intuitiveness of what we feel about something. Do we need to change something in our lives? So 
One reoccurring gift that typically comes cloaked in depression is an invitation to grow that necessitates really quinishing a formerly treasured job or relationship that has now become obsolete or moribund. So that moribund means death, dead. You know, when something's just dead, it's dead. And, you know, sometimes through childhood trauma, we try and revive something and give it life because that's what we were trying to do with our parents. We were trying to get our parents to love us. So we just try and, you know, be something else or please them regardless of what they were doing. This is what children do. Um, overreaction to depression essentially reinforces learned toxic shame. It reinforces the individual's notion when depressed that he or she is unworthy, defective and unlovable. Sadly, this typically drives him or her deeper into the abandonment, exasperating isolation. So you might see that in yourself that you, you feel depressed, you don't feel all together. So you just won't call anybody. You'll hide from people. You won't tell anybody how you feel. Um, and then he goes on to say, deep level recovery from childhood trauma requires a normalization of depression, a renunciation of the habit of reflexively reacting to it. Central to this is the development of a capacity to stay in one's body, to stay fully present to all internal experiences, to stay acceptingly open to one's emotional, visceral and somatic experiences without four Fs acting out. So I know that my fight, flight, freeze, fall now is so, so much better. I mean, it's got to be 90%, 90% better than it was a year ago, two years ago. Now I can have a freaked out moment for half an hour and then I'm done. Um, if I got went into fight, flight, freeze, in you know, because also I voice it now to people. I say, oh, that triggered me. I'm able to say that triggers me, that word triggers me, or I feel triggered by that without... Um, without projecting that onto somebody, I can tell them what triggers me. And that enables us to have a conversation with somebody about it. So we don't, you know, go into a full blown out, um, you know, panic attack and such like. He goes on to say, renouncing this kind of self-abandonment is a journey that often feels frustratingly Sisyphean. It's a labor of self-love and a self-nurturing process of the highest order, but it can feel like an ordeal replete with unspectacular redundancy with countless menial experiences of noticing, naming, and disidentifying from the unhelpful internal overreactions that depression triggers in us. So a relational approach to healing abandonment, okay? He says, I am a relational therapist. This is Pete Walker talking, by the way. I am a relational therapist because I believe this journey requires reparative relational experience. Healing complex PTSD and the attachment disorder that typically accompanies it is an interpersonal journey which needs to be initiated and shepherded by a therapist, a partner, or a trusted friend who has the capacity to stay unreactively present to their own depression and the various effects that attach to it. When a therapist has this level of emotional intelligence or a trusted friend or a partner, uh, he or she can guide the client to gradually release the learned habit of automatic effect, rejection and overreaction. So if you have a friend who can sit with you and they, that you say, I'm in fight flight and I'm freaked out, I'm freaked out. And they can sit with you and they can hear you without trying to fix you. And they say to you, well, where are you feeling it? You know, how are you feeling? And they don't tell you off and they don't tell you, oh, stop thinking negatively and stuff like that. When you've got somebody that actually is, um, as Pete Walker says, is, you know, basically helping you to hit that they're basically, you know, being relational with you. It's a relationship, you know, when we relate to each other and we can sit with each other. So he says automatic effect rejection and overreaction. A key operation here appears to depend on the eye and ear contact of a bi-hemispheric brain process. Daniel Siegel calls the co-regulation of effect safe and empathetic eye and voice connection with an individual with good enough emotional intelligence provides a working model and a limbic resonance to help her or him stay unreactively present to his or her depression and the fear that's attached to it. This in turn promotes the integration of the right and left brain functioning, helping the client or your friend or your lover, whoever it is, to feel and think simultaneously and ego 
I think it says e egocytonically. Moreover, as Susan Vaughan's book, he says a book called The Talking Cure, Avers says, such work appears to promote the development of the inner neural circuitry necessary to healthy manage and integrate depression and its accentuated effects. Okay. This is very good stuff here. So, you know, I hope you're still with me on this because this is not small information. This is really when this stuff sinks in and it took me a couple of years to get it, but when it sinks in, you go, wow. Okay. And then you begin to see how far ahead you've come in the game. So guiding the client or your whoever into somatic mindfulness, this is um, what he says. Therapists and our friends, of course, and each other can teach clients the practice of pain, non-reactive, self-accepting attention to their own effects so your own feelings yeah you can you sit with somebody and you say well where are you feeling that behaviorally this entails staying aware of focused on and present to the somatic experience of the abandonment depression so we look at the somatic experiences what what how does that feel in the body how is it where is it in the body you know where are we feeling it when i get i was feeling you know a little bit depressed i think um for a few hours yesterday or something. And I'm not surprised with what's going on in the world. I mean, I'd be surprised. Anybody telling me they're jumping with joy right now, I'd be really surprised. But I really feel it sort of in my in my face, like, you know, like very sad around my eyes and whatever. And I, you know, feel it in my, um, in my tummy as well, in my upper tummy, like just feel, you know, a feeling of gnawing and um, sadness. So... Typically, this process is, as it goes on, is indirect at first because depression so commonly and instantly morphs into the hyper aroused sensations of fear. Early work, when primarily involves, early work then primarily involves staying present to the kinesthetic, that's our feeling, sensations of fear and noticing the psyche's penchant to disassociate or distract from them. Disassociation can be either the classical right brain distraction of spacing out into a reverie, a fantasy, TV, computer, trance, fogginess or sleep, or it can be the left brain cognitive disassociation of becoming distracted in obsessive thinking. Particularly nephorous here is the inner critic's penchant, I think that says, for disassociating from and reacting to depression and fear and toxic cognition cognitions and reveries of endangerment and perfectionism over and over the clients need to be guided to rescue himself from disassociation the left or right brain so clock what that means and to gently bring his awareness back into or hers into fully feeling and experiencing the sensation of the fear and noticing his or her reactions to it sensations of fear may range from simple tension and muscular tightness anywhere in the body, especially in the, says the elementary canal, to nauseous, jumpy, wired feelings and shocks of electrification to shortness of breath, hyperventilation and diarrhea when it's at its worst. Although these sensations typically feel unbearable at first, persistence focusing on them with non-judgmental, non-assuring, awareness eventually lessens and quietens them held non-reactively enough they are seemingly dissolved digested and integrated by awareness itself so what we're doing is with healing we're not getting rid of something we're integrating this is really important to understand it's integrating it is important to note here he goes on to say that this type of kinesthetic focusing often triggers memories and unwork through feelings of grief about the client's abuse and neglect in his or her original abandonment. Um, and I'm sure so many, many of us have, you know, so many different stories and circumstances. And I know what I relate to that, you know, the original neglect, and then how you flash back and you remember. So this provides many invaluable opportunities to, um, to ameliorate PTSD by more fully grieving the losses of childhood. Therapists can also use the results of such explorations to foster the creation of an egocytonic and self-compassionate narrative that deconstructs the shame and self-blame the PTSD client typically assigns to his or her suffering. I describe a safe, efficacious process for this type of grief work in my book, The Tao of Fully Feeling. He's got another book called The Tao of Fully Feeling, Harvesting Forgiveness Out of Blame. He then goes on to say, with considerable practice, the client eventually begins to exhume 
from his fear an awareness of the more elemental underlying sensations of depression, sensations exceedingly subtle and barely perceptible at first. These sensations are initially as difficult to stay present to as they are to find. With guided ongoing practice, however, focused attending also digests them as they are integrated, again that word, integrated into the consciousness. As practice becomes more proficient, these feelings and sensations of depression sometimes morph into a sense of peace. And we've all had that, you know, when we're so freaked out, we're so we've had a nightmare where you know, in a really bad place of fight, flight, freeze. And then we go into a sense of peace, relaxation and ease. Such relaxation can even over time open into a continuum of inner peace that may stretch from profound equanimity to that place of unsurpassable peace that various Eastern pundits describe as the great void or the sublime nothingness. And we've all experienced that too, you know. So the inner somatic work, therapeutic gains, in diminishing automatic self-abandonment, which is what we're trying to do. We want to banish, you know, we want to not banish, diminish um, the self-abandonment in the face of fear or depression are argumented, argumented by individual introspective work. In my personal discovery of the skill, he is saying, by the way, I spent over an hour a day in meditation with my awareness of yo-yo facilitating between my body and my mind between these sensations of fear and the myriad disturbing, disturbing mentations of my inner critic, these drasticizing thoughts and visualizations were my critics outmoded historical interpretations that my feelings and sensations meant that I was in imminent danger of the abandonment of attack or neglect. My critic excoriated me increasingly to strive for safety through productivity and perfectionism. In the first year of this practice, I frequently had to white knuckle the hands, wait, <coughs> the hands of my chair. I had to white knuckle the handles of my chair to stay somatically present to my feelings, to break my adrenaline addiction. So a lot of us can have adrenaline addiction, you know, trying to be safe, trying to be safe. So, you know, to stop myself from launching into my preferred four F flight responses. So we will have one or two, you know, we, we use them all. But, you know, I was a more, um, um, I think when I was younger, I was fawn. And then I'd go into, I went through a period of the fight. And then I was in flight, like flight is one of mine. And also freeze as well. But you can read up the meanings of those. Continuing reading, I had survived my childhood with ADHD like busyness with marathons of activity that kept me one step ahead of my fear and shame stained depression. Gradually, as I used my focused awareness to digest my fear, I experientially discovered the rock bottom underlying core sensations of my abandonment depression itself. Over and over, I focused on the sensations of heaviness, swollenness, exhaustion, emptiness, hunger, longing, soreness, achiness deadness. Sometimes these sensations were intense, but more often they were very subtle. With time, I noticed how instantly my depression scared me and led me to echo my parents' toxic shaming. You're bad, worthless, useless, defective, ugly, despicable. Blessedly, with ongoing practice, I gradually learned to disidentify from the toxic vocabulary of the critic. I found myself more accurately naming these revisited childhood feelings as being small, feeling small, helpless, lonely, unsupportive, unloved, needy, as in profoundly unsuccessful in getting my needs for emotional comfort met. That's he's talking about his childhood and I can attest to mine as well. Camouflage depression, he goes on. Feelings of depression sometimes mimic gnawings of hunger especially the emotions of abandonment, which commonly masquerade as a physiological sensations, as physio physiological sensations. Feeling very hungry an hour or two after a big meal is an almost certain signal of abandonment feelings and not real hunger. As much as this hunger appears to be about food, it is actually an emotional hunger, an emotional longing for safe, nurturing connection and for the safe satiation of abandonment. Even after a decade of practice, I still find it difficult to differentiate this type of attachment hunger from physical hunger. One often reliable clue is that the sensation of longing for the nourishment of the attachment is usually in my small intestine, while the physical hunger locus 
is a little higher up in my stomach. I believe the extreme longing for sex and or of love, typical of sex and love addiction, can similarly be an encounter with our abandonment depression, especially when no amount of affection or sexual attention from another seems to fill that void of longing. On a parallel with force hunger, feeling tired is sometimes an emotional experience of the abandonment depression and entirely unrelated to sleep deprivation. Although over time, and you might see that yourself where you've had plenty of sleep, but you're still tired, you just wanna sleep again. So going on, I have experienced that too. Um, so although over time, the two can easily become confusingly intertwined, the emotional tiredness of not resting enough in the comfort of a safe attachment and belonging often masquerades as a physiological tiredness. When our abandonment depression is unreminated, any kind of tiredness, emotional, physical, commonly triggers us into fear, which the inner critic this is the last page, by the way. The inner critic translates into endangerment and imperfection and the accompanying of the adrenalization launches us into the one of the four Fs, the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. So if we're overtired or we're whatever, you know, we can be feel like we want to act out. Um, then he says, swidocyclothemia, I think it says. Then he says... Um, it's a sad irony that relating that reacting to emotional tiredness in this way can eventually exasperate it into real physical exhaustion via a process called, I call the cyclothymic two-step PTSD. Sufferers with a pr primary or secondary flight response frequently overreact to their tiredness with a workaholic or busyholic action. They can run so, they run so, compulsively from their depression that they eventually exhaust themselves physically and at times become too depleted or sick to continue running. When this occurs, they collapse into an experience of abandonment so painful that they re launch desperately into the flight response speed at the first sign of replenished adrenaline. I have witnessed a number of such clients misdiagnose themselves as bipolar because of the extremes that ensue from desperately pursuing the adrenaline high and eschewing the abandonment low. Adrenalization often becomes addictive because it self-medicates and counteracts the emotional tiredness that emanates from undigested and unworked through abandonment feelings. Especially noteworthy here is the endless and expensive journey that many survivors undergo trying to remedy emotional tiredness with um, physiologically based medical treatments. Even worse, the short-lived, if any, improvements of such approach increasingly arguments the shame and self-hate of the, su the sufferer over time. What's wrong with me? I've changed everything in my diet and my sleep and my exercise schedule. I've seen every type of practitioner imaginable and I'm still waking up feeling tired and dead tired. I mean, I felt that, you know, I went through a couple of years when my body was aching, my body hurt and, you know, I was tired all the time and I was trying to eat well and do all of these things and, you know, and they just weren't doing the thing. And, but as I've worked on the emotions and understood myself, you know, I've got this energy now, my body feels good. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but you know, I do feel good, you know? Um, so not every single day, but you know, 95%, 90% of the time I do feel good. So what's wrong with me? I've changed everything in my diet, blah, blah, blah. She said, I'm still waking up feeling dead tired. It's subtle and hard acquired skill, but learning to self-compassionately focus on the inex Adorable somatic experiences of sometimes feeling tired, bad, lonely, or depressed is the only way out of the cul-de-sac of self-destructive and unwarranted efforting. In this regard, the notable, he goes on about AA here. I'm, you know, I'm I'm not into that, but you know, somebody might be out there, some people it works for them. The AA 12-step acronym, he's talking about the acronym though, which is HALT. H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, can remind us to stop and pause introspectively to determine whether our abandonment depression has been triggered and needs the quiet internal self-compassionate attention described above. We can sometimes gain motivation for this difficult work by seeing our depressed feelings as messages from our developmentally arrested child who is flashing back to his or her abandonment in hopes that his adult self will respond to him in a more comforting compassionate and appropriate way. So we have to learn to reparent ourselves. This is the job of us now. And this is in Pete Walker's book too. 
this um, one I'm showing you. Through such practice, clients can gradually achieve this healing that the Buddhists call separating necessary suffering, normal depression, from unnecessary suffering, the internal hopelessness, shame and fear, and the life constricting acting out that ensues from unnecessary engagements with the inner critic and the four Fs. There you go. Brilliant. If you want help and you want a session with me and want to dig on this, what I'm telling you, just um, book a session with me and or drop me an email if you've got any questions. Thank you for watching this. I think I've got one more here. This is beautiful. We're here to become whole and becoming whole just means becoming aware. It doesn't mean that we've got to fix ourselves because we are not broken. Anyway, catch you later. Thanks for watching.